December the 10th, 1971, marked the end of the vaudeville style on Mothers, after a disgruntled fanatic physically assaulted Frank Zappa, resulting in Zappa's confinement to a wheelchair for a good amount of 1972. This marked a significant change in direction for Zappa, and during this period he produced multiple arrangements for a big band, the Grand Wazoo, and a smaller ten-piece, dubbed the Petit Wazoo. Although they operated at similar times, and even though the Petit Wazoo included members of the Grand Wazoo, the repertoire for both bands was quite different. The Grand Wazoo focused on harmonically dense instrumental works, such as The Adventures of Gregory Peccary, whereas the Petit Wazoo set would focus a little more on improvisation, taking advantage of the stripped back personnel. However, there were still some more elaborate pieces in the Petit Wazoo's repertoire. In this video, I'll be looking at one section of a piece that Zappa arranged for the Petit Wazoo, entitled Rollo. In a previous video, I looked at the melodic construction of the main theme, but this time I'll be focusing on the way that Zappa varies and develops the ideas in that melody in the closing segment, entitled Rollo Goes Out. There are multiple arrangements of this, but I'll be focusing solely on the 1972 version, which I have painstakingly transcribed. The original melody, Rollo Interior, which is developed by Rollo Goes Out, is harmonically ambiguous, and its strength lies in the careful handling of contour and phrasing, the transformation of its pitch material, and its regular reference to a simple motive as a key point of orientation. First, I will focus on what Rollo Goes Out retains from Rollo Interior. Most notably, the original C major motive remains the foundation, this time transposed down a step to B flat major. This still functions as a point of reorientation between sections, though this time it is modified upon each appearance to hint at the characteristics of the upcoming sections. Fragments of the melody are retained and repurposed. The first half of Rollo Goes Out is a variation of material from the first two sections of Rollo Interior, and relies on a fugal idea, accommodating the winds' capacity to play monophonically. The second half develops the material, and sees the fugal ideas collapse, relying on denser homophonic harmonies. This piece seems to be viewed by some as an exemplar of Zappa's contrapuntal abilities. I don't remember who has referred to it as such, but I feel like Dweezil introduced it this way when he and his band learned it a few years back. I actually disagree. The contrapuntal parts are not sustained for very long at all, just by vows in fact, and they aren't particularly sophisticated. In fact, in his book, Fundamentals of Music Composition, Austrian-born composer Arnold Schoenberg refers to the free melodic movement of one or more voices as semi-counterpoint. Zappa makes use of canonic imitation. Similar melodic voices enter periodically transposed by a perfect fourth each time, but their function is primarily as an embellished accompaniment to the main voice established by the first trumpet, which is supported and homophonically harmonized by the second trumpet which would qualify this passage as semi-contrapuntal writing, as opposed to true counterpoint. This is not to diminish Zappa's well-controlled handling of this passage. Multiple fragments of the melody have been balanced against each other to produce quite an intricate contrapuntal texture, but this is short-lived, giving way to rhythmic homophony for the rest of the piece. The first section juxtaposes the two main motives the aforementioned recurrent theme, and the St. Alfonso motive which marks the transition between sections. The first variation of the main motive is a 4 against 3 polyrhythm. Notably, the piece is now in triple meter, contrasting with the original statement of the theme which was strictly in 2-4. The trumpets and flugelhorn are harmonised in thirds, simply spelling out triads, mostly in versions of B-flat major, with stepwise voice leading producing a C minor, before settling on a C sus 2. The oboe and trombones play some imitative accompaniment in quarter notes, emphasising the 4 against 3 polyrhythm. They emphasise an E-flat sus 2, ambiguating the tonal centre. The bass and guitar play an A-flat pedal throughout this. The choice to use the flat 7 of a chord in the bass is something which has characterised key moments in each piece of zappers I have covered so far on this channel, and it seems to be deliberately deployed to cultivate a sense of slight harmonic instability. In some instances, this has been deployed seemingly subversively in cadences, 
as a refusal to resolve perfectly to the tonic, but in this instance the way it is utilised is slightly more interesting, serving a dual function as the 7th of the B-flat major card and the 4th of the E-flat sus2. As such, it can be thought of as mediating the two tonalities. This section ends with a sustained chord, which could be thought of as an E-flat major 11, but I would be hesitant to label it as such, as it doesn't seem to serve any such function. It may be better to think of it as an A-flat sus2 embedded within an E-flat major, with the addition of a D natural in the first trumpet to give the A-flat sus2 a slight Lydian colour. Having established the core features of this section using the primary motive, the secondary motive, the St. Alfonso motive, is used to transition into the development of the melody. The emphasis here is on rhythm. The parts all sound in unison and the harmony is quite simple. The oboe and the trumpets outline simple triads, an E flat major and two inversions of an F major, whilst the flugelhorn emphasises the second degree in the first instance of F major, soon resolving to the tonic. The trombones and flugelhorn work together to ambiguate the triads in the upper parts, emphasising a C sus2 and B flat sus2. Again, I look at this as a juxtaposition of different chords, rather than as one extended chord, simply because these chords don't seem to serve any great structural function, or have any great structural importance. Their sonic character is used simply to define the surface aesthetic. A clear call and response interplay is set up between the winds and the rhythm section. The winds as entries are displaced and then emphasised through repetition, and in the spaces between their entries, the guitar, electric bass and kit punctuate the phrases with stabs. Post-climax, the ensemble plays a glissando using indeterminate start and end points over one bar, performing a crescendo out of which the development of the melody can emerge. This nebulous texture is something which Zappa seems to deploy at various climactic points in his work, having used indeterminacy similarly in the middle of Redunzel. In my incredibly humble opinion, this can occasionally appear to be somewhat of a crutch, but in Rollo, I think this works to particularly good effect, especially in that it not only avoids disrupting the piece's momentum, but actually enhances it. The reintroduction of the melody from Rollo Interior is basically just a variation of the original at this stage, borrowing almost exactly the same sequence of pitches from its first appearance, with one small modification in the third bar, which ambiguates the implied harmony a little more, the sounding A being the flat 5 of the implied E flat major. This is a classic example of ISO melody, and is a technique that Zappa uses as a structural device over the span of his entire oeuvre, from Oh No to Moan Herb's Vacation. The main melody is articulated by the first trumpet and supported by the second trumpet, which harmonises at certain points but eventually converges with the main line. It is decorated by a kind of imitative canon, with each variation of the melody mutating it a little more than the last. These ornamental lines are assigned to the oboe and the baritone oboe, which the flugelhorn player, Tom Malone, switched to at this point in the original performances of this arrangement. The baritone oboe quickly groups with the trombones to underpin the trumpet parts by resetting the first eight pitches of the line in rhythmic unison, harmonised with parallel fifths. Meanwhile, the oboe groups with the trumpets, taking over as the lead melodic voice, relegating the trumpets to harmony. The oboe and trumpets are mainly harmonised in thirds here, producing simple triads, major, minor and diminished, for the most part. This section can be thought of as the gradual collapsing of independent strands into one rhythmic unison. This begins with the canonic texture, and quickly becomes a two-part counterpoint relying on two groups of instruments, the oboe and trumpets, and the baritone oboe and trombones. Zappa doesn't appear to be articulating any particular harmonic progression. To harmonise the oboe and trumpets in closely voiced thirds, and to harmonise the baritone oboe and trombones in fifths, are choices which seem to have been made primarily to clearly delineate the two simultaneous parts. Harmonising these two parts instead of simply setting two unison parts against each other adds a sonic richness, even if the harmonies are functionally meaningless in the traditional sense. Zappa seems to draw upon ambiguous harmonic choices in the final phrase, favouring augmented sonorities. Again, trying to view this in terms of functional harmony appears to be fruitless. 
The most important structural element here seems to be rhythm, and the texture resulting from the entries of each part. The tension is at its highest where there are multiple strands that are out of phase, and this is resolved when these lines collapse into a rhythmic unison. ISO melody and chord preferences create a harmonic cohesiveness, but again, this is at the surface level rather than at the structural level. Zappa clearly delineates the transition into the next major section by returning to the primary motive, modifying its rhythm in a 716 setting which contrasts with the steady quarter note pulse of the previous sections. This changed a couple of times mid tour. Sometimes this was played at half tempo, and sometimes it was omitted entirely. In later arrangements, Zappa settled on the half tempo version, but I transcribed it the way the Petit Wazoo most often played it. The motive is simply harmonized in thirds, spelling out a D-flat major triad. This is alternated with an F sus 2, a result of the alternating minor second intervals in the second trumpet and trombone parts. Zappa differentiates these gestures by modifying the contour of the first trombone, ending the phrase with leaps in alternating directions, contrasting with the scalic ascent in the second trumpet. Zappa punctuates the end of this short phrase with some less harmonically ambiguous ascending fourths, suggesting a G7 sus 2, the voices of which lead into an E flat major over A flat. This clear harmonic tension is resolved to a G flat major, quoting the B section of the original melody. Before the first major deviation from the original theme, Zappa reiterates the primary motive, this time in B flat over an A flat sus 2 chord. The melody is orchestrated around the middle of the trombone's range, leaving space for the rest of the winds to open up. This is where the piece becomes decidedly homophonic, with most of the harmonies sharing the same contour. There is very little contrary motion, and from this point onwards, the contrapuntal ideas from earlier are more or less entirely absent. As such, this section is structurally significant. As the point at which we see the total collapse of the contrapuntal textures that characterized the first part, it signifies the approach of the climax. The melody here is essentially a sequence, and is characterized by intervallic leaps and a descending contour. It is basically a call and response structure, with each phrase lasting a duration of four bars. There are minor variations in interval choice, so each cell is not a perfect transposition of the last, but the contour is always preserved, except for where it is reversed for one bar, in order to set up the response phrase. The harmonies here are mainly closely voiced triads, reinforcing the melody voice by imitating its contours and prioritizing vertical consonants. These harmonies can be described as roving. They don't function to express a particular tonality, but seem to be the consequence of the voice leading, coupled with the aforementioned desire for vertical consonants. The bass oboe enters just after the halfway point. It relies on chromatic and quartal gestures, and serves to give the harmony a greater density and to further ambiguate the tonality. Its contour also differs from the contour of the melody, and it distinguishes itself via contrary motion at key points, although this does not mark a return to the contrapuntal ideas which characterized the earlier sections. As with the earlier sections, the rhythm section serves to punctuate these phrases with stabs, emphasizing the neutral tones of the triads established by the winds. Consistent with the episodic form of the rest of the piece, the end of this passage is marked with the final reappearance of the primary motive in a clear A minor setting. This clarity is almost immediately disrupted when the B natural is modified to become a B flat, and a chromatic response phrase is articulated by the trombones, setting up the B flat pedal that permeates the subsequent phrase. This next passage functions as a bridge between the previous material and the climax. It returns to triple meter and emphasizes the B flat tonic which characterized the exposition material at the start of the piece. The melody consists of two call and response phrases, both two bars in length. The first is a sequence which takes advantage of the tonal ambiguity of the B flat sus 2. The first bar implies a B flat 7 chord, outlining the third, seventh, and fifth degrees in the melody, and the second bar implies an E flat 7 chord, outlining the seventh, third and first degrees. This so far suggests a strong E flat minor tonality, clearly outlining the five and one chords. The first half of the second phrase inverts the contour, and yet again exploiting the ambiguity of the sus2 pedal chord, the ascending fourths use tones strictly from the B flat major scale. On the third beat, 
The third and sixth degrees are lowered by half a step in an allusion to B flat minor. The final phrase inverts the direction of the half step motive and responds to the ending of the previous phrase via ascending fourths. Like the previous phrase, it takes advantage of the ambiguity of the sus2 by alluding both to the major and minor variants of B flat. I would note that I think the tonal ambiguity explains why some of these chromaticisms work, but given the clear preference of minor seconds and perfect fourths in this passage, it seems to me as though the phrase's identity comes more from its intervallic structure than what it seems to imply tonally. The B-flat pedal acts as an anchor for the phrase, and because of this there are apparent tonal implications, but this seems to me to be a consequence of setting the melody against the B-flat pedal, rather than being a structural harmonic choice. With the main ideas having been expressed, the motives are abandoned and the piece moves towards its climax with two highly chromatic descending sequences. This ambiguity is created to give the clear chords from the climax a kind of nebulous haze to emerge from, with a comical faux triumph. As with previous passages, this is structured as a succession of two bar call and response phrases with opposing contours. Melodically, these are built largely from fourths, interpolated with intervals of sevenths and sixths. Each first bar references a strongly minor tonality, which is ambiguated in the second bar where the material shifts down half a step. Each phrase is transposed down a whole step from the last and each transposition exactly retains the intervallic structure. The accompaniment relies on conjunct motion to maintain a clear foundation for the angular melodic material, descending exclusively in half steps. Rather than spanning a whole octave and resolving to A, the sequence ends on a B flat. The second sequence begins suspended over a C sharp and is more conjunct exclusively relying on minor and major second intervals. This one bar phrase is transposed down a whole step on each repetition and is hocketed between the trumpets. The melody is highly chromatic but the C sharp it is suspended over actually functions as a dominant, resolving to an F sharp for the climax. As such, the chromaticism can be considered decorative rather than structural. The climax is a conical bastion of pomposity and repeatedly emphasizes an F sharp 7 sus4 chord. The chord extensions are purely decorative, with the core harmonic focus being the initial 5 1 cadence and then the Lydian 4 1 cadence on which the piece ends. There is some interesting obfuscation of the downbeat here. The section remains in 2 4 until the end, but the initial displacement of the chord by a 16 creates some ambiguity which is exploited by the guitar part which plays a repeated figure which is phrased to make it sound as though the downbeat is an eighth note behind where it actually falls. The bass line moves the harmony towards its resolution, descending the F sharp minor scale until it reaches the sharp four. At this point the penultimate chord is a C with various extensions, the oboe leaps to the sixth, while the bass oboe maintains the F-sharp, which would function here as a sharp 11. This resolves to F-sharp major, and feels like a strong allusion to the Lydian mode. The deployment of this sounds to me like Zappa parodying the grandiosity of this closing section, especially when the 1-5 bass line is considered in conjunction with the toms, which here seem to be emulating timpani. So this piece isn't mainly contrapuntal, even if the most memorable part of it is the three-part counterpoint that lasts for about five bars. So even though you can have contrapuntal harmonies in rhythmic unison, in the case of Rollo the piece is decidedly homophonic because the contours are moving in parallel with each other instead of in contrary motion. There are still quite a lot of interesting observations to be made about Zappa's harmony. It's not really functional in the conventional sense most of the time. But it's also not very academic. He doesn't really take a highly structured serialist approach where you could analyse it with set theory or anything. This makes it quite challenging to analyse sometimes. It's not always entirely clear exactly how Zappa structured it, and you've got to do a little bit of digging, and you've got to have a little bit of background knowledge to try and figure out maybe what he was getting at. Brett Clement has actually written a very good analysis of Zappa's harmonies covering various periods and various styles, 
This is well worth a read and it will give you some insight into what Zappa might have been thinking. What's especially interesting is Clement's efforts to reproduce Zappa's card bible, which was basically an encyclopedia of Zappa's favourite cards, which he'd deploy in his orchestral work. The eagle-eyed might have noticed quite a lot of inconsistencies in the enharmonic spellings across different examples. This is because editing this video has kind of been like an extra proofreading session for my transcription. I initially took everything down in C, and looking back over it, when I've transposed it, I think there's a couple of things I missed on the first couple of proofreads. Former Zappa Family Trust librarian Kurt Morgan was kind enough to give me a little bit of feedback on the score, but I'm especially grateful to my friend Philip Fjellström, who pointed out quite a few things during the first draft of the transcription, which I later revised. Philip's done some interesting stuff drumming with the jazz fusion group, Krona, which is well worth a look at and I'll leave a link in the description. He's also helping me with some kit parts for a piece I've written, which will be well worth listening to once it's finished. I highly recommend going to my Bandcamp, which is in the description, and spending a lot of money until it's out, and then you can spend some more on that.